Welcome to LeaderCast, episode 285. Welcome to LeaderCast, Transforming Missions podcast with Tim Bias and Sarah Thomas, providing you with insights and resources you need to lead a movement of Jesus followers. Tim, what were you doing in August of 2013? Sarah, we haven't been gone that long. (laughs) (laughs) No, (laughs) we weren't, but that wasn't why I asked the question. It is good to be back recording podcasts, and so... Today, why I asked the question is we're going to look back to look ahead. We're going to briefly look at some of the technological changes, societal shifts, and the evolving role of the church in community to get us to the place where we can highlight three key aspects of missional leadership. So we thought a 10-year period might be a reasonable time frame to, to look back on. So tell me, Tim, what were you doing in August of 2013, 10 years ago? Well, Sarah, I'm old enough that it feels like it was just yesterday. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking that I just had a, a granddaughter graduate from high school. So 10 years ago, she would have been eight. Elementary and school. <laughs> elementary school and having fun with her and, and her sister who, had, who was just starting to school and then their youngest sister who was only three. And just being with them in the backyard, I can I can think of that. that. That's not helpful for what we're doing right now. I was the pastor. That, in fact, the last church I pastored was the pastor was ten years ago, and I remember all the work that went into preparing sermon series and trying to do that in 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 relationship to. Um, well, I think you were even preaching in another location, so we tried to do things some, somewhat in coordination. Mm-hmm. And I remember some of the conversations 10 years ago that I don't know if we were having them today, it would be we'd be looking at them a little differently. But some of the conversations in the church, we were moving to a to like a one a one board leadership model. And some of the things that because that, we were we were moving away from representation and more to mission. Right. We still have that tug of war going on in the church today, but we were already behind 10 years ago in making that shift. Because our focus was more on representation than it was on the mission of the church. And everybody having their say. I mean, I I remember saying very vividly, you can have your say, but you may not get your way. <laughs> that did not make me popular, but but I've been using that for a long time. I remember you saying that, and you have been saying that for for a while. Yeah, you're bringing you're bringing back some some memories. So, in terms of what was happening in the world, maybe what Tim has just offered will help you think back to where you were at in August of 2013 and where your family was at and the church that you were a part of or pastoring. Here are a few things that were happening around us in terms of technology. (laughs) Google Plus was three years old. And if you're thinking, wait, does Google Plus even exist anymore? No, it doesn't. Skype was 10. That one blew my mind. Like To stop and think that in 2013, Skype was already 10, and now, like, who uses Skype? <laughs> where where, what, where is Skype? Skype? <laughs> Facebook was 9. Twitter, or the app formerly known as Twitter, X, uh, yeah, I don't even know how to say that, was 7. Pinterest and Instagram were both 3. Snapchat... Chat was two, and YouTube had been around for eight years. TikTok and Threads didn't exist yet. I, I, those are all interesting. I'm I'm an old guy, Sarah. I remember ten years ago the phone ringing at the parsonage, and it was a landline Not, phone, wasn't it? it? It was a landline <laughs> phone, and the person on the other end said, well, "That phone number has been the same phone number since 1860." <laughs> 
And and here is where sometimes I get ahead of myself. I haven't had a landline phone since 2001. And I was just having a conversation with my mom and dad because they're thinking about finally getting rid of theirs. And I said in 2001, I remember I had moved from Oxford, Ohio to Mason, Ohio, and my cell phone was a, a toll call in Mason because it was an Oxford number. And so I was changing my number And whenever I had to fill something out online and it asked for a phone number, I couldn't put my cell phone number in. They wouldn't allow it. They recognized it as a cell phone number. And so I always had to put the church number in because I didn't have a landline phone. Oh, how things have changed. (laughs) I think we were still talking about, too, that when we handed out our, our phone numbers, we even ask ourselves, do we hand out our cell number? Right, right. The cell phone but, was a, a private number, only a select. You had right. to be you had to be a special person to have somebody's cell phone number. Lots have changed in ten years. Sure has. <laughs> so, so what about movies and the box office, Tim? Well, I think one of the big hits at that time was Iron Man three. I can only tell you that not because I've seen it, but just because. The research says it was our Iron Man (laughs) 3. And The Hunger Games. And that episode or that movie was Catching Fire, The the Hunger Games. And Despicable Me (laughs) 2. And maybe the one that I do remember the most because I had three granddaughters was Frozen. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and... And when I looked at that list, I thought, gosh, some things don't change. I didn't see any of those movies in the theater. I have seen Despicable Me 2 and Frozen since then, but not the other two. Probably tells you more about where I've been at in the past 10 years than than anything else. So here's another fun one. It is August of 2023, and in September... Apple is planning to announce the iPhone 15. (laughs) So it makes sense that in 2013, the iPhone 5S was launched in September of 2013, and Apple labeled it the most forward-thinking phone. (laughs) And it still had a button on it. (laughs) Yeah, just can you use an iPhone 5 today? Uh, yeah, I think you can use it, but what I can tell you, because my dad has an iPhone 8, that after this release, his phone, he's going to need to get a new phone because the security updates and any updates to the operating system will no longer be valid. But maybe that was what I was asking. Yeah, it was- but there's your tech lesson for this podcast for today. <laughs> So in January of 2023, Barack Obama was sworn in for his second term. And that's also the the year the Boston Marathon bombing killed three and injured over 200 people, almost 300 people. Man, just some really negative stuff. That was, that's when um, Trayvon Martin was fatally shot. You You remember... He's 17 years old, and he's just walking down the street in Sanford, Florida. And George Zimmerman at that time was a person that that, that approached him. And I, the stories are all because he just because the boy was walking down the street and had a hood on. That was what was going on in the world at that time, or at least on the streets in Florida. Now, this is not as significant as the things that Tim just mentioned in any way, shape, or form. But I had to pause. New words like twerk, and are you ready for this one? Selfie were added to the dictionary. (laughs) So that means the iPhone 5, you could take a picture of yourself. (laughs) (laughs) And we had a new royal baby. Prince George was born 10 years ago. And finally, the world welcomed a new pope, Pope Francis. Sarah, I think we missed one, and that is that none of us were meeting on Zoom. <laughs> no, we were not. <laughs> so let's let's return to 
where we were both at because we were we were together in Cincinnati at Hyde Park. And in August, I would have been coming off of my fourth summer of what we called Awaken the City. And I'm sure because it was August, I was sleeping in a way because the two previous months were exhausting. And I was also working on my doctorate in missional leadership. And it happened a couple of times that I would share things with you, Tim. And what you would say back to me was something along the lines of, Sarah Thomas, you're 10 years ahead of yourself. And I think at the time, I took that as a pat on the back. But I think what you might have been trying to say to me is, Sarah, people aren't going to hear you when you when you communicated. <laughs> I think what I was trying to say is that what you were sharing about what you were learning in missional leadership was so needed, but but the acoustics weren't well. People couldn't hear it. That's I think that's what you just said. They weren't ready for it. And I was excited to hear it because that's part of the work that I'd been a part of before coming to, to Hyde Park. Yeah, I was, I was so wanting people to see and get ready for, oh, what we're experiencing now. The reality was, and I, I don't like saying this, but it is the reality. The reality was there was enough money to pay for what was needed. The sanctuary was full. People were participating in ministry. And here here I am trying to say to people, we need to focus on missional leadership. We need to see the mission that is right out our door. And I wanted people to start making a shift, but there wasn't an urgent need to do so. I'm still not sure. And I'm, I'm hesitating because I don't like saying this, but I'm not sure that we understand the urgency and the need for missional leadership 10 years later. And you've already heard Tim and I name all that has changed in the 10 years. And that impacts who, who we are and how we lead as Christ-centered leaders in the church. So Sarah, before we talk about the, the missional leadership, I think one of the things that surfaced that still has a little sting to it, but yet I was kind of proud of it, was when we were pushing so hard to be missionally focused that we were accused of being focused to a fault. You were. <laughs> but I, I, as I look back, I regret not pushing harder. So with that said, when we talk about missional leadership, what are we talking about? So there's several different ways that I could answer this, but the first way I would answer it is to say missional leadership is about recognizing God's mission as the guiding point. It's what you just said, Tim. Being it's being focused to to a fault that we are focused on God's mission, and that is the north star of what we do as as a church. Second, let me pause there before I go on to the second one. Let me contrast that with God's mission includes the people that are already a part of the church, but it does not solely focus on the people who are there and helping them to feel good about what is happening. A little contrast there. Second, I'd say missional leadership is about claiming the changing nature of the church and her relationship with the society that we live in. So what am I pointing to there? More and more, we need to embrace a missionary approach to our leadership, being present with people, getting to know who they are, what are their hopes, their dreams, their hurts, their hang-ups. It's being with the people. It is the relational aspect of ministry. We don't live in a world any longer, and someone's going to say to me, Sarah, you're 10 years ahead of yourself. (laughs) We don't live, and, and I'm not referring to Tim, We don't live in a world any longer that people are going to come to the church. The people who come to our churches have been a part of other churches. To reach new people, we have to get outside the walls of our church buildings or do something in our church buildings that meets people where they're at. We'll get to that in a minute. 
Third, missional leadership is about knowing and understanding and embracing the local context where God sent you. I think they give us plenty to talk about today. There are others. So what, what I've heard you say is that we start with God's mission. So let me, as you've done, do a little contrast. And that is, in my years of ministry, and, and it's, it's been shifting over those 50 years, but the major shift is taken in the last 10 and maybe in the most recent past three. And that is, the, the mission of the church is not to please the people who are the members of the church. That's not God's mission to make you happy. Find that one in scripture. <laughs> it doesn't well, exist. And, and and in the culture that we live in, it's not God's mission to make you prosperous. And when we say, when somebody says, I'm blessed, it's not because you can drive a new car. And it's got not God's mission to back up your point of view, your opinion. Your political position. So okay, all let's that, not go there because we'll have that, a whole I'll, we'll have a whole preaching sermon from Sarah Thomas on that one. <laughs> so we'll come back to that when we get to three hundred episodes. <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm saying starting with God's mission, we're putting God in the driver's seat. Yeah. So that means that God is no longer our co-pilot as you see it on bumper stickers. God's driving the, the vehicle. Right. You get to be in the passenger seat. You're along for a right. fun ride. So that, I guess, maybe the way that that would show up in our conversation and what we'd be doing is, what is God up to in our community? I mean, that's, that's what you're going to talk about. The question is, how does it pass? If God's in the driver's seat, and we know that the mission is central to everything we do. If it doesn't pass the mission test, the question is, why are we doing it? Just because I'm, I'm wanting to jump ahead because I'm so excited about, who, about your work and what you've done. Let me just put it this way. Anytime you as a church leader are trying to then do strategic planning or planning for the future or whatever it's going to be, Put everything that you're doing as programming on the shelf and start with the mission and say, what's God now doing in our community? That's putting God in the driver's seat. Yeah. I, I, Sarah, I'm chomping at the bit. You go ahead. You describe missional leadership and how that, how that works. Well, let, let me just say a little bit more about the mission test. When, when I think of that, what I think of is stopping to ask the question, how is this helping us to reach out and receive new people? How is this helping us to offer Christ to people? How is this helping us to help people practice the faith? How is this helping us to engage in service in our community and to, to live out acts of justice? If you can't answer those questions for the programs that you're offering in the life of the church, why are you doing it? And, and when you walk through the ministries and you find yourself in a place with nothing on that list, because I've been there with churches, the question to ask is, okay, what's God up to in our neighborhood? What's God doing in our community? Where are we seeing Jesus show up? And where can, where can we join what God is already doing? And Tim, your question comes up in, in that line of questioning as well, is what do we need to do that no one else is doing? Because when, when we're leading with God's mission and we're starting there and we're focused there, our personal preferences no longer lead the way. They get out of the way. <laughs> because... God is so much bigger than any of us and our vision and what we can see and hear. God's going to invite us to do things that we, could, we never thought or imagined we could do in the life of our local churches. But we have to be willing to stop and ask the question, okay, what is God doing in our communities? 
So not to let anyone off the hook, but I think you would agree with me. Uh, when we've asked that question in the past and we've, and we've challenged preferences, there have been people who have said, well, what's wrong with me? Is there something wrong with the way I believe? Is there something, uh, I mean, I, this is the only way I know. And that's why we say it matters where you start. Because if you start with Jesus and you start with the mission, you see the world differently than when you start with your preferences or with the church, the church as an institution. I'm not opposed to the institution, but that's not where you start. That's a byproduct of the mission. And that, so, so it matters where you start when we talk about uh, mission. Absolutely, it matters where you start. And I think for, for me, what I see happening is the urgency of that question of how is this helping us to focus on God's mission? The urgency of that question right now is because we live in a society that is not, what's the language that I'm looking for, a mesh with the church, that we are, we're living in a society that you cannot assume now that everyone is Christian. We lived in a time in some of our lifetimes that that was, that was true. And in my most generous interpretation of those individuals that you mentioned saying, <laughs> saying, well, what's wrong with me? I think it was easier to have programs that mm, were kind of loosey-goosey, if I can use that language, <laughs> that were maybe more about personal friendships and personal preferences when culture and church were one and the same. Right. Today, that is not the world that we live in. And so if we are not clear about our focus on Jesus, the logical question that people ask is, who are you and how are you any different than anybody else? You're just a social club. You're a card club. You're a book club. You're a country club. I'm already a part of one of those. I don't need to be a part of you, and I don't need one more thing to do. So the urgency of that question of how is this a part of focusing on God's mission? When we start with Jesus, when God is in the driver's seat, we then follow. It is not us pushing our personal preferences. It is not about, oh, how can we create a nice place for my friends, friends to come? It means that we're focused on helping people become followers of Jesus. And the sad commentary on that is I think why it's scary and hard is we have not done a good job helping people to understand who are a part of the church, what it really means to follow Jesus. It, we have made church for over 50 years about coming and participating in a nice talk and nice music on Sunday mo morning as an observer, not as an engaged participant. And come Monday morning, nothing changes. So it's not about how good of a talk you have on Sunday morning or what the preacher did. So, Can you tell what, I feel passionate about this? <laughs> so what we've learned and what you're saying is, is, that, is that to be focused on mission is it's a shift from program to people. Absolutely. It, it, it's a, you know, I get caught up on those personal preferences because we have taught people, we, the general we, for all of us who are been a part of the church for 50 years, We've taught people to think that if they get what they want, then we're doing what we're supposed to do. Right. And, and, and we're paying the consequences for that. So the focus isn't upon programming or upon preferences. It's really upon people. And another place that, that we, you know, in my whole ministry career is that it's not focused on performance, Performance, uh, that, that might be a better, well, it's just, it's a different way to, to say what I was saying about, you know, being an active participant or a passive receiver. If you attend a performance, it's different. Sorry, I interrupted you. 
Well, I mean, but that's good for an attractional model. I mean, if and that's what, as we've lived through the years that I've been in ministry, it was all about getting people into the church and not about what was happening, how the church was related to the community. And so it, it was all about, well, we will have the best praise band in the, in the city. You know, I, I, I think I mentioned this to you earlier, and I've learned to be snarky from you, so I'll just do a little <laughs> snark here. I don't uh, know that that's a good thing that I've passed along. <laughs> but I'm just wondering how long, how old does contemporary music have to be before it's not contemporary? <laughs> and now, it, now Tim's meddling. <laughs> I'm not going there, because <laughs> um, I'll say see, something that will get the the stop button pressed on the podcast. <laughs> and that's just in, that's in regard to music. And when it comes to, to preaching and you've said it several times, and that is we have, we are no longer in a time where people want to hear a good after dinner speech. And that's even, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little embarrassed, but I'm a little hurt about it, too. I was taken to lunch once by an attorney in town who gave me a whole set of, of DVDs, I guess, that would help me be able to tell more funny stories in my sermons. <laughs> so, uh, I, But it's not about programming, and it's not about performance. So that's, that's right. where we're going. I'm sorry. I'm, I, right. Therapy session's over. Let me let me be positive here just for a minute. Say worship becomes a celebration of what God's doing in our midst. And 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 how can we celebrate what God's doing in our midst unless we're able to recognize God's doing in our midst? And so when we say it's more than programming, it's more than performance. We're talking about being focused upon God. You put God in the driver's seat, we're we're being focused upon God. Now, are we ready to move to the second one? missional leaderships about naming the changing relationship between the church and society and leading people to respond in appropriate ways. Are we ready? I think we're ready, but our listeners are going to need to wait until episode 286 for us to explore the second aspect of missional leadership. So join us next week on episode 286 as we dive into that. And as a reminder, you can find show notes for this episode at transformingmission.org forward slash 285. And remember, who you are is how you lead. Bye for now.